I'm going to tell you about, uh, share some thoughts about where I see challenges for current research in AI, machine learning, deep learning, uh, and especially um, considering the agent perspective and questions of causality, which uh, I think uh, deep learning is going to embrace in order to move to the next stage. So, um, if we if we look at some of uh, you know limitations of current approaches, one is sample complexity. In other words, how many examples we need to learn a particular task. It's true for current industrial supervised learning, but it's even more true for uh, reinforcement learning uh, systems. If you compare to how many examples a human needs to learn a new game, for example, or a child needs to learn a new task. Um, in addition, there are practical reasons why we need to tackle this if we're gonna build things like robots um, or other machines that experience the, the real world where you, you, you can't have um, uh, the luxury of uh, a huge number of examples because each of them can be dangerous, um, lethal, and, and costly. And, and also, in the real world, unfortunately, we don't have uh, a perfect simulator. We don't have simulator of humans, for example, with which we could uh, train RL systems to do dialogue, which you know, we would all dream to have. Um, another issue with current approaches is a lot of the high-level concepts and knowledge about the world is provided by humans who label data. And we have yet to uh, achieve this dream that my colleagues and I put forward a few years ago of um, deep learning systems that discover by themselves the high level abstractions that, uh, of the kind we communicate with language. Um, also, if you look at the kind of mistakes that current deep learning systems make, uh, whether it's on images, text, uh, or whatever, you'll see that um, well, when they work well, they work well, but when they fail, they fail in ways that are very different from humans that reveal somehow fairly superficial clues that they're taking advantage of rather than capturing the kind of um, high-level abstractions as humans use. So that's motivation. And if we want to uh, dig a little bit uh, deeper in uh, where we are versus where we would like to go, one really nice division is uh, to think about uh, what psychologists called system one and system two tasks. So we can uh, do things very quickly that are intuitive. This is called system one tasks, uh, like perception, for example. And we do this uh, very complex computation in an unconscious way. In other words, we can't explain to a machine how we do that, which is why deep learning and machine learning has been so useful to be able to tackle these kinds of tasks. But there are other tasks which classical AI try to achieve uh, that are more of the kind you know, uh, which we do consciously, things like reasoning, uh, things like programming, uh, you know, building algorithms. Uh, these tasks are slow, logical, sequential, and um, current machine learning doesn't really address these things as well as I think they should. So uh, one of the areas that I, I want to talk a lot about, but I think really um, would help us bridge the, the gap here is uh, not try to just do the system two task by themselves, but actually combine the, the, the strength of both sides uh, with um, uh, things like grounded language learning where we, we try to learn the meaning of sentences in a way that allows the system to uh, catch what those words refer to in some kind of model of the world. So, so now let me tell you about the agent perspective uh, for deep learning. Uh, of course, there's, there's deep reinforcement learning, which has been very successful in games, but mostly it was about how deep learning could be used as a black box to solve some of the problems of generalization that you find in reinforcement learning. So, so it's like reinforcement learning guys use deep learning and, and it helps to solve reinforcement learning problems like playing games. But what I'm talking about here is sort of going in the other direction. How does uh, the perspective of a learning agent, which can act in its environment, change the way that we can design representation learning machines, deep learning systems that are supposed to be discovering good representations? 
So, so for one, once you consider the um, agent perspective, you have to go away from the classical machine learning framework of IID data and a fixed given data distribution. Instead, you have agents which interact with their environment and can change it, which means they change the distribution from which they're learning. And that could be troublesome, but it's also, well, one of the big messages of my talk today is it's actually a way to bring a lot of information to the learner that up to now we've considered um, a hindrance, these changes in distribution, whereas in fact they can help teach the learner about how the world works. So, so these changes in distribution arise because the agents do things, uh, maybe the learner itself or other agents. I mean, if we want to have machines that interact with humans, they will be doing things. Um, and we know that for a lot of uh, machine learning systems that we build in labs, when we bring them to the real world where the distribution is a bit different, uh, there's a loss in performance. It's difficult to generalize out of distribution. In fact, all our theory breaks down. So, um, so one aspect of, of uh, dealing with this, I think, is embracing the challenge by building machines that not only understand the particular data you give them, but somehow uh, try to figure out uh, the underlying causal structure and, and understanding of how the world works, which is behind that data. And furthermore, um, the agent perspective also gives us something really nice. Um, it's the possibility for the learner to, like in active learning, to purposely go after knowledge, right? So this is one of the things I'm most excited about. I won't have time to talk about this, but uh, all of the work that is going on right now in reinforcement learning with what you could call unsupervised reinforcement learning, where agents uh, explore the world in order to acquire knowledge, I think is gonna be crucial in the future. So, um, yeah, so, so uh, I said many of these things, but let me uh, um, add a particular element which again touches on practical applications. So I was uh, considering a few years ago the problem of um, training autonomous vehicles, and one of the issues that comes up is you have these rare situations, for example, accident situations, um, that can matter a lot, right? And we don't have enough data of this, and so the systems we build today are, um, it's difficult for them to generalize on, on these very, very rare cases, which are unlike the, the kind of uh, normal training data they get. And how do humans manage to go around this problem? Well, even though I've never been in a really serious accident, thanks, you know, I mean, I, I'm really glad it didn't happen. Uh, I can imagine these things. So, so our capacity of imagining these um, uh, maybe even impossible situations when you, we, we read friction, we, we read science fiction, or we go to science fiction movies, and we can imagine these impossible scenarios. Um, so this ability to imagine counterfactuals in, in the context of causality, I think is something that we need to build in our machine learning systems for a lot of good reasons. Um, in the last year, one of the threads uh, connected to uh, what I've been talking about, which uh, uh, I want to mention a little bit, is changing the perspective of generative models. So I'm, I'm talking about imagination, but you know we've been very successful with things like GANs and variational autoencoders to build systems that can generate images and now uh, speech and things like this. Um, but this is not the kind of imagination we have. The kind of imagination we have isn't producing pixels. It's producing these fuzzy abstract images in our mind, right? So that's the kind of imagination we need. And so we've been investigating machine learning methods, uh, representation learning methods, that um, allow to generate and to learn features at the level of these unobserved latent variables. So um, one of the tools that we've been working on, which I find really interesting, is uh, GAN-related methods, adversarial methods, to um, uh, estimate and, and uh, maximize mutual information. So why is that relevant? Well, um, if you want to um, 
learn about how, let's see, this uh, works. Uh, is there a pointer here? No, no. okay. So uh, if you want to predict something that's going to happen in the future, but in the latent space, if you were to just do maximum likelihood or something like this, then uh, when you backprop uh, into the encoder that maps the low-level data to your representation, it could just learn to produce representations that are constant because they are easy to predict. So, so the usual objective function in latent space, if you want to make predictions in latent space, are, are not quite appropriate. They would, they would collapse to something bad. And there may be several ways of dealing with this, but one of the approaches we find most exciting is um, instead of thinking about a prediction task, we think of it as a maximizing mutual information between past representations and future representations. And, and that, because it also maximizes the entropy of the representations, prevents this collapse and does the right thing. So, so we've been working on these kinds of things um, and looking at ways to uh, maximize information between uh, uh, parts of uh, the high-level representations that have a spatial uh, location and uh, they're correspondent at different times and between those, those locations, those localized features and global features um, and, and, and making progress in uh, learning in an unsupervised way good features for, for reinforcement learning tasks in particular. Now, let me uh, focus a little bit more on these latent representations that we would like to be imagining with, I mean, we'd like our machines to imagine. If we, if we do a little bit of introspection about our own imagination, as I said, it's not just that we're imagining these abstract things, but it's also that what we have in our mind when we imagine isn't like a movie of the future. So not only it's, it's not at the pixel level, but it's also uh, focused on just a few aspects of the world at a time, right? So, um, if you consider your thoughts, right, they, at any particular moment, focus on a few aspects of the world. And then uh, you project yourself into the future, maybe you're thinking about a car coming on your left, and you're not thinking about a zillion other things which could happen, might happen, will happen. You're only thinking about a few things that matter for your current decisions. So, so this kind of focus on a few aspects in your uh, imagination and projection is very different from the usual machine learning idea um, of predicting the full distribution at the next time step. So, so this kind of uh, um, exploration is uh, something I introduced a couple of years ago in a paper called The Consciousness Prior, which I talked about last year here as well. And what we're doing now with this is seeing how we can use these ideas to um, provide uh, better priors on how the high-level representations should be and how we could use this for things like planning. Um, so, uh, yeah. Let's, okay. And um, so if we're gonna be selecting a few dimensions of the high-level state on which we're gonna focus computation, well, we need attention mechanisms. And it turns out one of the greatest and I think undervalued advances in machine learning in the last few years is the development of attention mechanisms. In fact, if you look in uh, uh, NLP state-of-the-art systems today, almost all of them use attention mechanisms. And uh, these attention mechanisms allow basically to focus computation on a few things at a time. This is it. And you can see how this is central to the idea of system two computation I was telling you about, where, right? Where we are gonna sequentially focus on a few things that matter. So that's very closely related to this consciousness prior, but also to the general task of uh, reasoning and so on. And because uh, those attention mechanisms are soft attention, so it's like graded attention on, on, on many things, uh, you can still use backprop to train these things. Um, oh yeah, there's another thing that's really important about attention mechanisms. Um, uh, it allows to change the nature of what neural nets are doing. So classical neural nets are vector processing machines. I mean, even images are seen as like big vectors with a topology. 
once you introduce a tension mechanism, what it allows to do is to process sets, right? Because if, I'm, if I can focus my attention on a few elements, that means I, you know, I can select them from a set, and I can now process sets and generate sets and transform sets. This is what transformers are about. So working on sets, working on objects, again, is something that makes a lot of sense for these kind of high-level processing that we want to achieve. Um, so in the consciousness prior idea, I, one of the uh, um, proposals is to, in, the, in terms of architecture, in terms of how we uh, compute and do inference with these ideas, is the idea that uh, in addition to the usual mapping from input to some high-level representation, which now I'm going to call the unconscious state, there's this attention mechanism which selects from the unconscious state a few relevant elements, a few objects from that very, very large set uh, to produce a small set that is going to be the current conscious thought or um, maybe an imagined um, uh, state of the world in the future. So. Um, this conscious state is very small. It's, it's, uh, it's the kind of thing you might express in a single sentence, right? And, and there would be a lot of connection with natural language understanding because the objects you want to manipulate in the conscious states are like words and concepts we, we name. Um, another way to think about this uh, from a graphical models perspective, from a, a sort of abstract probabilistic perspective, is because we focus on a few variables at a time, the only kinds of dependencies we can easily represent are involving very few variables at a time. And there's a way to capture that in, in a graphical models uh, uh, thinking is simply to say that the joint distribution of, uh, you know, of you know, this very high dimensional unconscious state, all of the variables we could focus on, um, is a sparse factor graph. So a factor graph is a graphical model in which the joint is decomposed into a product of uh, potential functions, each of which touches some subset of variables. And you can think of these potential functions as like little constraints uh, that tie a few variables together. And sparse here means that these potential functions only look at a few variables rather than all of them at the same time. So, so that's one very, very simple way to encapsulate this uh, notion. And that sparsity constraint, you can think of as a prior. It's a constraint on the kind of variables uh, that we want to have at that level. So pixels don't enjoy this uh, constraint. Uh, if you try to capture the joint dependency between pixels, you're going to need to essentially look at almost all of the pixels in the image to get some sensible prediction about one pixel given other pixels. Whereas if I, if I use these high-level variables, like uh, if, if I were to drop this, I'm going to be able to catch it and, well, I wouldn't say let it fall on the ground like in, in, in the slide. Um, to, so these kinds of statements um, can be made with very, very high probability. So not only these uh, involve very few variables, but they are strong statements. Like I can, I can predict things with very, very high certainty. Um, and um, that creates a pressure on the kinds of variables that we can represent um, at that level. Um, another source of constraint that we can put on these high-level representations come from the agent perspective. So agents can do things in the world, and in a deep learning framework, um, these agents want to represent both the states of the world, this is what I've been talking about up to now, but they can also represent their policies, their intentions, their goals, which have to do with the kind of actions that they can implement, right? So when I was saying I can drop this, what, I, what happened is I, on the fly, constructed a policy for achieving a goal, which was to you know, drop this with this hand and catch it with this hand. So, uh, this information was represented in my brain, and it would be represented in some uh, distributed way, and, 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 and I'd like to know how to um, represent that kind of uh, 
intent information. At the same time, uh, I'm representing the objects on which these policies are operating. And there should be a relationship between these two things. So if I have a policy for catching this, this policy should have sort of obvious dimensions that have to do with the object position, right? Because these are the quantities that matter for that policy. So this uh, led to ideas in the last couple of years that we started in 2017 uh, and more recent work where researchers think of these two spaces, the spaces of actions, intentions, options, policies, and the spaces of uh, states of the world. And um, one nice simple thing we could say is we'd like to maximize mutual information between these two types of representation. If you think about it, the extreme of maximizing mutual information is a one-to-one -one mapping. So in other words, um, for the um, Z position of this object, there is a policy that I can uh, create which, which, mu which manipulates it, right? And so there's a, for any factor in the world that I can control, there is a policy that, uh, you know, it directly is associated with it. So, so maximizing information means I can predict one from the other perfectly, right? So if you see me doing this action, you can predict what was my intention. And if you ask me to do it, I can find out in my head the policy that will do it, right? So there is a two-way connection between the two. Um, yes. So, so this is connected to uh, the notion of generalizing beyond the training distribution that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and it's connected to um, another fundamental limitation of current machine learning, which has to do with how we organize knowledge. I'm gonna try to explain how this is so. But um, one of the most uh, exciting advances in deep learning in the last uh, couple of years is the progress in meta-learning. And meta-learning essentially is learning to learn, have uh, an inner loop of optimization and learning and an outer loop of optimization and learning. And why is that relevant here? When you're thinking about agents changing, moving the world, um, because now we can consider uh, those changes and uh, arising, uh, giving uh, rise to many distributions, many uh, types of relationships between the variables um, as different meta examples. So I'll come back to that. Um, so, but if we want to connect different um, environments corresponding to different distributions, um, if we want to be able to generalize to a new environment from the environments we've seen during training, we need to think about the link, the connection between those environments. Like, if I say nothing about how the world might be in the future, I can't have much certainty about uh, my predictions about the future uh, making sense. And it helps in machine learning to think about hypotheses we can make about the world that allow generalization to happen. Now it's a kind of generalization across distributions as the world changes and we consider different environments. Um, and one of these hypotheses that I find the most interesting is the hypothesis um, that Bernard Shopkoff uh, communicated to me and that I read in his book, uh, 2017, on causality, which I suggest very strongly. And it's the idea of, uh, that comes actually from physics of independent mechanisms, the idea that we can explain the world um, by the uh, composition of a bunch of small uh, pieces that compute in, for real, um, and that the different pieces, which they call mechanisms, are in an information sense independent of each other, so that what you learn from one doesn't tell you much about another, and um, if one changes, you don't need to change the others in order to continue um, uh, modeling the world properly. So in, in our work, we have been writing on the idea that uh, most of the changes that happen in the environment, as you go from one environment to another environment due to actions of agents or whatever, um, are localized. There are small changes when you express 
the, the, the structure of the model in the right way. So let me illustrate this with a picture. Right, so think of these little uh, circles as parts of a big model. And each is gonna have its own parameters that capture some aspect of the world, like some conditional dependencies, for example. Um, now, something happens that changes the environment. Somebody comes and does something. And the claim is, with the right way of dividing our knowledge into pieces, only a few parts of our model needs to change to account for what happened. And the reason this makes sense is that we are agents that are physical agents. We tend to influence the world uh, in the first place at a particular time and place. So our effects are gonna be localized. Of course, then there might be chain consequences. Um, but if we model things in the proper way, we can explain that change um, uh, with uh, very few uh, changes in parameters or very few inferences, and so we don't need a lot of data to make sense of the change in distribution. So um, as, a, as, a, uh, as a case study to understand this, uh, in, in a recent paper we've looked at something really, really trivial, which is how does an agent deal with the change in distribution when there's a joint distribution between two variables A and B, and um, uh, maybe uh, one is a cause and the other is the effect? and somebody is gonna come and change the prior distribution, the marginal distribution of the cause, right? So it's sort of a very standard, simple scenario. And we can see in this scenario what happens if you have the right model, which separates um, uh, the joint into P of A times P of B given A versus the wrong model that separates it into P of B times P of A given B. In terms of the joint distribution, it doesn't change anything either way you do it. But in terms of what happens when there's a change in distribution, uh, it, it, it completely changes the game. And in one case, you need to um, modify all of the parameters to account for the change in, in, in the cause, whereas in the other case, you only change to, need to change the parameters of the uh, prior P of A. Um, what happens today with today's models is that they, um, they, they, they want to explain the change in the data by modifying all of the weights of a big neural net. And so you're gonna need a lot of data to account for those changes. But if we are able to modularize the knowledge into smaller pieces that have this sort of independence notion built in, um, then uh, you, you could, I think, reduce a lot the issues of catastrophic forgetting, poor transfer, uh, domain adaptation, and so on. So, um, yeah, so, so one of the things uh, that we've been starting to look at as well in this context that previous work on causality hasn't looked at very much is where do we get the causal variables in the first place? So classical work on causality, which is meant to help people in social sciences, uh, healthcare, and, and, and so on, uh, assumes that some scientist is gonna give us the variables, right? Okay, so there's uh, the smoking uh, variable and the uh, cancer variable, and we can observe them. But of course, for an AI uh, system, uh, like a robot, um, it doesn't work like this. Uh, the baby uh, just watches pixels and sounds, right? And from those lower level things have, have to infer the, the high level causal variables. So uh, this is sort of, uh, I think, a new task for causality, which makes a lot of sense in AI, which the, the kind of questions I've been asking, I think, can help us uh, deal with. Um, so, I, I don't have a lot of time left. Um, yeah, let me skip this. So we wrote a, a paper which uh, is, uh, is being rejected from Europe, of course. Uh, <laughs> but it's okay, I've got nine others accepted. But this was the best one, anyways. Um, um, which, which looks at this question and tries to turn the uh, changes in distribution from a hindrance to a signal to learn about causal structure and learn about how to modularize uh, knowledge. And, and here I wanna quote uh, Leon Boutou, one of my friends who's also working on causality these days. You can see it's a hot topic. Um, and he gave a, a, a keynote at ICML and he said, nature, 
does not shuffle environments. So, so when he says environments, he means like distributions of data. And so we shouldn't. And the reason he was saying this is that there is really, really important information in those changes in distribution. So for example, in our paper, we exploit those changes in distribution, just the fact that there was a change in distribution in order to discover whether A causes B or B causes A. But more generally, in the changes in distribution, there is information about what is it about the world which is stable across distribution versus what is not. And things like the causal structure tends to be stable, right? Uh, so very, very fundamental knowledge about how the world works uh, is going to be invariant to changes in distribution. The set of variables, uh, which I call the causal variables, these high-level variables, on which we should be doing the computation uh, is also something stable, right? So maybe the values of these variables change or their marginal distribution changes, but which variable matter in general is something stable, right? So there, there's a lot of information that we're currently throwing away when we uh, take our data sets and we do the usual thing of shuffling the data so we get one IID distribution. So we have to change our ways. Um, so I, I, I'm not gonna give you a lecture on meta-learning, but if you don't know about it, you should learn about it because this is, this is a, a, a way that we can uh, deal, with, uh, uh, deal with this problem of uh, uh, changes in environments as sort of meta-examples by which we can uh, optimize things like what's the right way of uh, modularizing our knowledge, uh, which variables are cause and effect for, for which variables, and so on. And uh, we've been exploring that as well to detect uh, what are the, the right variables, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly approach my conclusion. Um, so so the, the, this little work that I mentioned at the end is also interesting from a cognitive perspective. One of the questions I've been asking myself for a long time is, how do infants, which cannot act much in the world, like they're almost, they're very passive, they can move their eyes and they can cry, uh, um, uh, how could they capture causal structure in, in the world, right? And our experiment suggests that, in fact, just um, being a passive observer, but being um, uh, on the lookout for these changes in distribution, for example, parents do things and then the world has changed, um, can provide inf information about the causal structure. In addition, if the learner, even the passive learner, tries to infer what were those changes, right? what happened, right? the parent did this, then the causal inference can be much more efficient. So we have another paper which uh, is, uh, is gonna be submitted to ICLEAR, uh, where we find that we can, we can uh, uh, scale that causal learning uh, much more efficiently if the learner tries to figure out which variable was modified. So the, 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 the learner doesn't need to be told what the intervention was, but it can infer it. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm gonna close with this slide uh, to tell you a little bit of where my group is going looking forward. Um, we, we want to train systems, learning agents, which build a world model that captures the uh, causal structure, but also the right space of variables, of abstract variables, on which one can reason, uh, and which can uh, be a good representation for accounting uh, for the changes in distribution that happen in the real world due to other agents doing things. And so making it possible to get much better out of uh, distribution generalization. Um, I mentioned also how uh, this can be important for exploratory behavior. So if I have a sort of self-knowledge of um, uh, the things I know and I don't know about the causal structure, I can use that to decide where to explore in order to acquire more knowledge about how the world works. Okay, thank you very much.